Good morning. Good morning. Once again, we welcome you here at the Second Baptist Worship Center to Word Alive. Once again, we're grateful for your presence, for your participation, and your prayers. We pray that all is well and that God has continued to look over you and bless your life in a very positive way. Uh, we celebrate the fact that this is Black History Month and we come together to uh, be reminded of our history and our impact on human history all over the world. We are such a rich people with such a diverse culture, individuals who have been a blessing and have been blessed. And so this morning, we just want to thank you once again for being supportive, for uh, blessing us with your presence. We also ask you, uh, if you would be so kind as to hit that like button if you're being blessed by this ministry, and also to share this particular Bible study with other individuals that you know, without a doubt, need a word from the Lord. This morning, we're just so grateful that we continue to study from the book, uh, The Gospel According to Dr. Luke, and we know that there is a, a great impact that the Word of God continues to have on our lives. For those of you who have indeed uh, been sick, we are celebrating with you because God is continuing to bless your life and to strengthen you as you move forward. This morning, we're reminded once again that Minister Tammy White is not with us this morning here at uh, this Bible study. She is at home. She recently uh, got out of the hospital, and we're grateful for her recovering and praying that God would continue to strengthen and encourage her. She's a vital part of this particular ministry and this part of the Bible study. Sis, we miss you much. We love you, and we're praying that God will continue to be with you and strengthen you as you move forward in life. And then we are asking uh, that God will continue to bless those of you who indeed uh, experience death in the ranks. We're asking God to give you comfort and peace as only he's capable of doing. Specifically this morning, I'm talking about my uh, brother and sister-in-law, uh, Mary and Elijah, and just praying that God would indeed strengthen you and encourage you in, in the loss of his mother. Uh, so we just pray that God will encourage you and bless your life mightily. Also, we are asking God to continue to uh, anoint us with his Holy Spirit, who's our comforter, our teacher, our guide. And we're just praising God for what he is willing to do in us. This morning, as always, we're going to go before the Lord, requesting God to bless us in a very favorable way, and then acknowledging our shortcomings and just asking God to be kind. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you uh, once again for the opportunity to come together, to come into your presence. We do indeed acknowledge uh, our many faults and failures and ask you in the mighty name of Christ Jesus to forgive us. We are weak creatures in desperate need of your strength and power. And so, God, we're just asking you to continue to guide our lives in a very real way. We've lifted up uh, Elijah and uh, Mary and the entire family. And equally, I continue to lift up my daughter, Antoinette, and my grandbabies uh, and ask you, God, if you will just comfort them in the loss of her, her uh, fiancé, her boyfriend, and ask you, God, in the name of Christ, uh, just to give comfort and strength. And then, God, we pray this hour that all of those who continue to convalesce at home that you will give them the strength to recover and the assurance of knowing, God, that you've not deserted them, but you're with them as they go through the challenging times. So continue to speak to us. Bless us with your spirit, who's our teacher. Give us sense enough to hear, understand, and then to be obedient to your word. We thank you in advance, and we celebrate the miracle that awaits us. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. And before we delve into the scripture this morning, we do have some announcements that need to be made. And I'm going to beat Minister Tammy White up for not being here to make these announcements this morning. I know you're watching, so you know already that I, I've said that uh, you owe me right now. Uh, so let's take a, a listen real quick as we uh, find out what's happening in the life of the congregation and in our immediate community. First off, we want to be reminded that this is indeed Black History Month, and the Second Baptist Worship Center is celebrating in a special way this month. First off, we want to recognize 
that this past Sunday, Minister Jeffrey White, excuse me, Jeffrey Washington, did an awesome job uh, in sharing with us a very important person uh, indeed in the life of black history. Mr. Board in Kentucky, uh, he did an awesome job sharing Boyd's history with us, and we are grateful. This coming Sunday, Minister V will share with us uh, Black History Moments here with the church, and then following her the next Sunday, uh, we'll have Elder Khalees McGibbony to come and to share uh, a few moments of Black History with us as well. So you can see it's just a time that we celebrate our history because we have indeed added so much into the history of America and life in general. Uh, we will also have a, a Black History uh, Month breakfast and a book. It's on February the 11th in our community and it's from 10 to 12 noon. Uh, the doors open at 9.30 for breakfast. Uh, it's a pancake breakfast and books, poems by African American authors read by members of the local community. Uh, children's coats, shoes uh, will be donated by the Coatsville Women's Destined for Change. So you want to be a part of it. And the location is one City Hall place, City Hall, Coatsville, Pennsylvania. So again, that is this coming Saturday, the 11th from 10 to 12. Breakfast begins at 9.30 a.m. Please be supportive. Uh, make your presence known. Get out there and be a part of this event celebrating a Black History Month. Also, Vets Helping Vets, Thursday, February the 16th, 1.45 to 3 p.m. Veterans are invited for life refreshments and to receive a, a free toiletry bag assembled by the veterans uh, residents at the Community Living Center at Coatesville VA in honor of Black History Month. So you can see our community is doing some things uh, that will aid our community and also at the same time reminding us of our rich history. Uh, also be reminded that on February the 17th, this pastor, this congregation, uh, literally is celebrating the pastor's birthday. Uh, February 17th is my birthday and the church wants to make sure uh, that the membership recognizes that birthday. A men's fellowship meeting, February the 18th at 9 a.m. Those of you who are part of Second Baptist, uh, those of you who are a part of the community, feel free to come in to be a part of the men's fellowship on Saturday, February the 18th at 9 a.m. Also, a pastor's birthday celebration will be Sunday, February the 19th. February the 19th, pastor's birthday celebration so come on out, worship with us on the 19th at 1030, and there will be a celebration that will follow. Uh, Second Baptist Family Soul Food Meal, calling all chefs, calling all chefs. Sunday, February 26th, calling all chefs in the house. All those desiring to show their soul food expertise, please donate a dish or dishes to make our celebration successful. All are welcome. Again, we are inviting you to come be a part of this soul food dinner here at the Second Baptist Worship Center on February 26th. Stop by or call to sign up. Sign up sheet in the lobby uh, at the welcome desk. Also, please remember this. This is the last announcement that we have for today. It is raffle, raffle, raffle. Trustees have a raffle basket. Uh, it is called the Eagle Basket. Wow, the Eagle Basket. Uh, also, Shepherd Staff has a basket. Uh, movie, movie night basket and dinner basket. Drawing date, February the 26th. So please remember that there will be a drawing of these baskets on the 26th. You just have to purchase the tickets uh, for these particular baskets. Those conclude the announcements that we have for this morning. Uh, just remember we have been trying to condense our announcements, uh, but there are some things that are pertinent that need to be announced. Uh, in our community and in the church. This morning, we have taken a look at the gospel according to Dr. Luke in the 18th chapter. And so there are some awesome uh, divine revelations that take place in this 18th chapter. And we want to see how it was indeed historical, but it has some relevance for us today. Listen in as I read from Luke 18, the contemporary English version, beginning with the first verse. The words as Jesus told his disciples a story 
about how they should keep on praying and never give up. And it just reminds us that in the process of our praying, we must present our petition to God and then never give up on what it is God is doing or what it is we are asking God to do. So don't be derelict in your conversation with God. Prayer is a communication that we have with God. It is defined as a loud cry unto the Lord. Obviously, prayer usually contains a sense of urgency in it. God, uh, we have a need. God, we have a, we have a request for somebody else. God, we just want to celebrate what you're doing. God, we thank you. God, we praise you. God, be with us. Various types of prayers and in this particular chapter, Jesus is informing his disciples that you really need to take the time to converse with God. In verse 2, the word says, In a town there was once a judge who didn't fear God or care about people. That's a dangerous position to be in when in fact you are so idiotic that you literally don't have any fear of God and you really don't care anything about people. Have you ever come across people who really don't seem to have a care about humanity at all? And better yet, they live out their lives in such a way that they really don't fear God. So they will just about do anything or commit anything. In verse 3, the word says, In that same town there was a widow who kept going to the judge and saying, make sure that I get fair treatment in court. Now, the, obviously, there is a consistency in this particular dialogue. She continues to go uh, before this judge over and over again. And she's requesting that of all the things, that she at least get fair treatment. And now, that sounds like most of us, uh, we would at least like to get a fair treatment when we go before the judge. In verse 4, the word says, for a while, the judge refused to do anything. Finally, he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about people, I will help this widow because she keeps on bothering me. If I don't help her, she'll wear me out. <laughs> you can hear the humor even in the text. He is concerned that she's going to wear him out if he doesn't do something about giving a reply back to her. And so he finally concedes to her and decides that he better do something. Notice the condition of the sister. She's a widow. And just remembering that a true widow is defined as someone who doesn't have a husband. The husband has passed on, doesn't have a son to take care of them. Uh, because if, in fact, they had sons to take care of them, then there would be no need to petition anyone else. She is a true widow. She needs help. Verse 6 says, The Lord said, Think about what that crooked judge said. Won't God protect his chosen ones who pray to him day and night? Won't he be concerned for them? He will surely hurry and help them. But when the Son of Man comes, will he find on this earth anyone with faith? This sister had faith that this crooked judge would do something to aid her. Now, if in fact this crooked judge was willing to do something because of her persistence, uh, it will suggest to us that the God who loves us immensely, the God who created us, keeps us, and sustains us, will also bless us because we're persistent in what we're asking God to do. We believe that God can do something, so we have faith to know that God is going to handle our situation. My Lord, if we have faith to believe that God's going to do a thing, guess what? God's going to do it. The one thing that we've been taught is that whenever God sees faith in us, God must act. And I believe that to be true. In verse 9, the word says, uh, Jesus told a story to some people who thought they were better than others and who looked down on everyone else. Wow. Now, don't forget, he is sharing this information with his disciplined ones, with his disciples, in hope that they will learn a valuable lesson from the stories that he tells. And remember that Christ is the best storyteller who ever lived. And so there is some impact that he wants to leave on these individuals. So he tells a story uh, about some people who thought that they were better than other people. 
you know, there are times when you've been at work in your community, in uh, the marketplace, in the church, when you run across people who think they are so much better than other people. And so often it's because of their station in life, because of what they think they own or what owns them. And so somehow they perceive that they are better than. Let me assure each and every one of us that none of us is better than anyone. We are just the children of God attempting to do or to be a blessing to others. In verse 10, the word says, two men went into the temple to pray. Notice there's two of them. What did they do? They went into the temple, the place of worship, the place of prayer, to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. One was a Pharisee, one was a tax collector. One who obviously knew of the law, knew the Torah, practiced it, or at least should have been practicing. The other was a tax collector who was obviously hated by all uh, those in public. Verse 11 says, The Pharisee stood over by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not greedy, dishonest, and unfaithful in marriage like other people. So he's making an assessment of other people and then gauging his self-righteousness by what he sees in others. There are times in the lives of individuals when we will have a tendency to gave our, gauge our self-righteousness by what we see in somebody else. We will think that we are so much better off because right now we may be at peace, because right now it may appear that we are doing quite well. But in all actuality, we're no better than anybody else. We've just been blessed by God because God loves us and God is wanting to do great things in and through us. The word goes on to say, and I'm really glad that I'm not like that tax collector over there. I go without eating for two days a week and I give one-tenth of all I earn. So he's making an assessment. He's looking over at the tax collector and he's decided that he's doing much more than the tax collector and is much better off because he is fasting. He is giving to aid individuals out of his abundance. It is no big thing when you're helping people out of your abundance. Uh, some individuals have very little and they give so much of what very little they have. But when you've amassed a great deal and you give a little, it doesn't appear that you're doing a great deal. There doesn't appear to be much sacrifice. But the word here is suggesting, Jesus is saying, that we should not be gauging and looking at somebody else and becoming judgmental. We should just do what it is we do out of the goodness of our heart. Verse 13 says, The tax collector stood off at a distance and did not think he was good enough even to look up towards heaven. He knew uh, that there were some infractions in his life. He knew that there were some troubling moments that reminded him of his inconsistencies in life. Nobody had to point that out to him. Nobody had to tell him. He knew. He knew that he was a sinner, so he would not even raise his head to look up to heaven because of what he knew about himself. There are some areas in our own personal lives when we know more about ourselves than we'd like to. He was so sorry for what he had done that he pounded his chest and prayed, God, have pity on me. I am such a sinner. He knew what he was. He knew about his wrongdoing. He knew his wrong steps. And he confessed to God, I'm such a sinner. Have mercy on me. Have pity on me. Bubbling over pity. Then Jesus said, when the two men went home, it was the tax collector and not the Pharisee who was pleasing to God. If you put yourself above others, you will be put down. But if you humble yourself, you will be honored. Wow. The, the Pharisee had elevated himself whereas the tax collector came to the realization that he indeed was a sinner 
in need of the mercy and pity of God on his life. One went one way, one with the other, and God states without a doubt that he was more pleased with the psyche, the attitude of the tax collector than he was with the self-righteous Pharisee. There are times when God is more pleased with the individual that we have looked down upon than he is with us. Because we can have a tendency to assume a posture that we are so holy and so sanctimonious when God just wants us to live out our lives in a way that we recognize we need God. In verse 15, the word says, Some people brought their little children for Jesus to bless. But when his disciples saw them doing this, they told the people to stop bothering him. Look at the narrative. Here are parents who are concerned about their babies. They've decided they want to bring the babies to the Christ, to have the Christ to bless the baby. But the disciples are watching carefully and have decided that it is a bothersome for them to bring the baby to Jesus. So, Jesus called the children over to him and said, Let the children come to me. Don't try to stop them. People who are like these children belong to God's kingdom. What were the people like? He said, People who are like these children belong to God's children or to God's kingdom. It implies, obviously, that children are dependent upon their welfare from God. They are innocent. They cannot indeed protect themselves from uh, those individuals in life. Uh, they are waiting uh, to be cared for. They are waiting to be protected. And God is taking up that position, making sure that his children, his people, are protected, are provided for, cared for, and loved. In verse 18, the word says, an important man asked Jesus. Note he's an important man. Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Now, be reminded, he's perceived uh, as someone who is important. So he pretty much is perceived as a person of notoriety. He has come to Jesus. He's labeled him a good teacher. Jesus said, why do you call me good? Only God is good. You know the commandments. Be faithful in marriage. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not tell lies about others. Respect your father and your mother. I go back to the beginning of verse 19. He asked the individual, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Only God is good and perfect. And he says, if you want to know the answer, you know what the commandments are. Be faithful in marriage. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not tell lies about others. Respect your father and your mother. These are the qualifying acts of an individual who wants to be uh, perceived before God as someone who's giving their best. You want to give your best. Be obedient to God's law and his way. In, in verse 21, he told Jesus, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was a young man. He has perceived that he's already done what it is the Christ has asked him to do. He says he has been doing this since he was a young person. In verse 22, the word says, when Jesus heard this, he said, there is one thing you still need to do. You say you followed all of these items, but there's still one thing that you need to do. Go and sell everything that you own. Sever ties with your possessions. Get rid of it and then follow me. He said, 
Then come and be my follower. When the man heard this, he was sad because he was very rich. Wow. He was entangled by his possessions. Even though he laid claims to being able to follow all of the mandates that Christ had given to him, the one thing that seemed to grip him up was his possessions. How often is it in life that we say we have rendered our all to Christ when in all actuality there is something that still grips us up, something that still holds on to us, something that has taken the place that God wants to hold in our hearts. This man had possessions and he was saddened because he could not let go of his possessions. It is a dangerous thing when we possess items that literally take possession of us. We must be careful that we are never perceived as individuals who are owned by what it is we claim we earn. When Jesus heard this, he said, there is one thing you still need to do. Go and sell everything you own. Give the money to the poor and you will have riches in heaven. Then come and be my follower. When the man heard this, he was sad because he was very rich. And in verse 24, Jesus saw how sad the man was. So he said, it's terribly hard for rich people to get into God's kingdom. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into God's kingdom. And the scenario presents the impossibility of a camel being capable of going through the eye of a needle. Even when we think of this being a practical thing, a real thing, let's say we're looking at a small needle and it is impossible for a camel to go through it. Jesus is literally looking at a geographical location in the city where there's an entranceway to the city and it is so small and narrow that it's referred to as the needle. It is a small entrance and in it, other small animals and individuals can walk through it, but the camel, because of its load, because of its size, cannot come into the city via this particular entrance. It is called uh, the eye of the needle. Jesus says it is impossible for the camel to go through the eye of the needle, just like it is impossible for a rich man because of his or her love for the objects that they own because they cannot render or give up their possessions to totally give themselves over to God. There are individuals today who've become so enamored with what they own that they've forgotten that God is the one who has given them the blessings that they have and has allowed them to go forward in life. My Lord, we are in a dangerous predicament when we proceed that we are so wealthy that we don't need God any longer. The word says, when the crowd heard this, they asked, how can anyone ever be saved? If the rich couldn't be saved and they couldn't get in, how can anyone be saved? Verse 27, Jesus replied, there are some things that people cannot do, but God can do anything. Praise God. There are some things that we cannot do for ourselves, but God can do all things. It's good news to know that in spite of our inabilities to do it for ourselves, if we trust God enough, if we have enough faith to believe, to believe that God can do it, God will do it. The word goes on to say in verse 28, Peter said, remember, we left early things. We left everything to be your followers. Peter is reminded that when they left their homes, when they left their friends, when they left their families, they left everything behind. They left their vocation. Uh, they left any revenue that they may have had behind. And they want to know, since, since we've left everything, you talk about, the rich, but we, we've given up everything. What, what shall we receive? 
Jesus answered, you can be sure that anyone who gives a home or a wife or brothers or family or children because of God's kingdom will be given much more in this life. And in the future world, they will have eternal life. So it's one thing when you've given up what you think is a great deal. God has promised that he will bless us also in this life. But not only in this life will our God bless us, but he's also promised that his blessings will move beyond these mundane shores and we will experience his ultimate blessings throughout eternity. The blessings that God has for us will never cease. They will never stop. He will always be blessing us in the eternal kingdom. So it's not just a partial blessing, not just now, but it will be forever. In verse 31, the word says, Jesus took the 12 apostles aside and said, and again, he's taking this as a golden opportunity to lecture and to teach his disciples certain areas about how they ought to live, how they ought to behave themselves, how they ought to govern themselves, in and around people. He says, we are now on our way to Jerusalem, talking to his disciples. So he's now giving them a heads up because it is Jerusalem where Jesus is to give up his life on behalf of all of humanity. He says, so we are now on our way to Jerusalem, to that holy city, to that place where the temple resides, well, we know the people who should be following me, individuals who should be supportive of the coming of the Messiah, will now be the individuals who will aid in the demise of the Christ. Everything that the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will happen there. So this is not something that's new. This is not something that should come by surprise. This is something that the prophets wrote of old something that they had prophesied years ago, something that's been laid out that will happen to the Messiah when he does come. And it will all happen in Jerusalem. So they shouldn't be so upset that, about the fact that it is coming, that it is happening, because it's been foretold. And in verse 32, the word says, he will be handed over to foreigners who will make fun of him, mistreat him, and spit on him. Look at what the Christ will have to go through. Look at how they will indeed mistreat him uh, as the Messiah, as the Son of God. Because the perception is that they don't believe that he's the Son of God. They don't believe that he's the Messiah, and therefore they reject him. Verse 33 says, they will beat him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. And so again, he gives them this prediction. He gives them the, the, four, the forthright answer to what's going to happen. And that is that the Christ is going to come. Uh, these individuals who are foreigners will beat him, will kill him. Uh, but above and beyond this, on the third day, when he indeed has been declared dead, he will arise from this death to live throughout eternity. That's good news for those of us who have faith in God, who believe that the Christ will do exactly what he says he will do. There are individuals, even today, who believe uh, that the coming of Christ never happened, that there are some individuals who are still waiting for the coming of Christ for the first time, whereas Christians believe that indeed he has arrived the first time and we are patiently waiting for him to come again. Verse 34 says, the apostles did not understand what Jesus was talking about. They could not understand because the meaning of what he said was hidden from them. You would assume having walked with the Christ for a prolonged period of time, at least three years by now, you would assume after listening to him, after watching him, after witnessing the miracles that he has wrought, that they would know that anything that he says has power and sustainability but they did not fully understand or comprehend what this all meant or how they could hold on to it. Today there are still individuals who indeed have word, read the word of God who perceive that there is something unique about the Christ 
something that is so pronounced, and still yet they cannot comprehend how he could possibly be the one who calls himself the Son of God. As we move forward, in verse 35, the word says, When Jesus was coming close to Jericho, a blind man sat begging beside the road. Look at what's transpiring here. He is arriving at a place called Jericho. And historically, Jericho was that place where the marauders were hide out. It was a strategic place where individuals could literally wait for innocent uh, individuals to pass through this particular valley or area and then begin uh, to take the wares, take whatever it was they had just because they found themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. Jesus was coming close to Jericho and a blind man was sitting, begging beside the road. A blind man is sitting here and he's begging. He is underemployed, unemployable. And this individual is waiting for someone to help him. He is begging for assistance from individuals. Humanity today is blind unto the truth and many are sitting along the side of the road and they are begging for aid and assistance. They are looking for sustenance to help them when they are going through challenging times. In verse 36, the word says, the man heard the crowd walking by and asked what was happening. So he could not see, but he could hear. He heard the commotion. He heard these individuals who obviously were anticipating the coming of this great preacher. He's heard rumors about the Christ, but obviously he had never met him. But strategically at this moment, he is taking the opportunity to make his way to the Christ so that somehow he might get some aid and assistance from the one person who's coming this way at this time. The man heard the crowd walking and asked what was happening. Some people told him that Jesus from Nazareth was passing by. You do remember Historically, Nazareth is that place where the question was asked, can any good come out of Nazareth? It was a location where individuals assumed that nothing positive could come from Nazareth, and yet it was Nazareth out of which Jesus came. Some told him that Jesus from Nazareth was passing by. So the blind man cannot see, but he can hear. And the word is, that the Christ, the one coming out of Nazareth, is coming and passing by. So the blind man shouted, Jesus, son of David, have pity on me. If no one else can help him, if the doctors couldn't relieve him of his blindness, if in fact there are some issues that he's dealing with that nobody can seemingly do anything about, he believes that if he can call upon this preacher, this individual who has worked miracles previously, maybe he'll have pity on him and do something about it. The world today is crying for aid and assistance. They indeed are asking God to have pity. The homeless, those indeed who are underemployed or unemployed, those who are sick, those indeed that the doctors have given up on, those indeed who appear lonely, those indeed who somehow are struggling to get through life with all the cares and concerns that seem to be going on around, they are looking for God to have pity on them. The word says, the people who were going along with Jesus told the man to be quiet, told the man to be quiet. They were trying to silence this man, even though this man was opening his voice because he was in need of assistance coming from the Christ. Do you think if you were in that type of need, do you think if you were blind and begging and in need of substance, 
anyone could silence you or stop your voice? I don't think so. I think that if I was in need and, and God was allowing his son to pass by, I think I indeed would continue to petition of the Son of God in hopes that he might help me in my miserable condition. The world is in a miserable shape. When you stop and look at the world and notice that individuals are taking uh, the lives of innocent people, when they are doing ride-bys and shooting through people's houses, when indeed they are deciding that they're going to take vehicles from other individuals, when, in, when indeed they are attempting to take life that they cannot give, the world indeed is asking for aid and assistance, but it doesn't appear that anybody seems to hear they could not silence the man. Then the world will not be silenced as they are looking for aid and assistance now. The text says, but he shouted even louder. This man knew that the rabbi was passing by. This man knew that this preacher had some capabilities of helping him. The individuals are asking him to be silent, but the man will not silence his voice because he has a great need that only Jesus can help him with. The world is crying out louder and louder because they recognize that they have a need that nobody else can fulfill it except for the Christ. So we cannot silence them at all. They will continue to cry out to God and they will get louder and louder. The man got louder and louder and he said, Son of David, have pity on me. He acknowledges who the Christ is. He acknowledges the position of the Christ and asks, that he help him. Are you literally crying this morning, petitioning God to do something about your situation? Is there sickness that you just can't seem to get past? Is there indeed some sense of financial strain and woe that is upon you that you don't know how you're going to handle it? Is it indeed some job that you once had, but now you no longer have, and you don't know what you're going to do about it? Please trust God and cry out to him, trust in him to hear your voice and to begin to do something about your predicament and your situation. Because God, when he sees our faith, when he hears our voice, God will give an ear to what it is we're saying and begin to bless us according to his perfect will. That's good news this morning for us to know that God has not turned away from us. God has not given a deaf ear to us. He will hear us and bless us. In verse 40, the word says, Jesus stopped and told some of the people to bring the blind man over to him. It's good news to know that when we cry out to God, when we truly petition God to bless us, God will stop, will turn to us, and will begin to do a thing that will bless our lives in such a way that there will be no doubt in us that it is the Christ who is blessing us. Petition God, turn to God, and watch what God will do. Jesus stopped, stopped moving towards Jerusalem, stopped and told some of the people to bring the man to him. Society indeed is crying out with a desperate need they just need somebody like you and I to stop for a moment and to bring the individuals to God, knowing that God is waiting to bless them. They're waiting for you to bring them over to the Christ so that Christ literally can do something about their predicament. When the blind man was getting near, Notice that when he was getting near, he may not be there yet, but he was getting close. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? As we are getting close, when we are approaching the Christ, the Christ is already working. He just wants to hear us inform him of what our needs are. What is it you want Christ to do for you? What predicament do you find yourself in that you can't get out of? What situation is so overwhelming that all you can do 
is lay it before him and trust him to do it. The man, before he can even arrive to Jesus, is being asked by Jesus, what is it you need? What is it you want? What can I do for you? He's asking the question of you this morning. Where are you? What's happening in your life? What do you want me to do? When you tell Christ what it is you want him to do, it's then that he responds. It's then that he is ready to bless your life in an awesome way. The young man said, Lord, I want to see. He answered, wow. The young man recognizes that if I can see, life will become so much better for me. I'll no longer be a beggar contingent uh, my life contingent upon what others will do for me. I don't have to wait for a handout. I can just cry out to you and wait for you to bless me. Lord, I want to see. In your life, can you honestly say, Lord, I want to see. I want to see how I can get out of this situation. I want to see you for who you are. So that indeed, God, I can rejoice and celebrate knowing that it was the Christ who brought me out of my predicament. Verse 42, Jesus replied, look and you will see. Your eyes are healed because of your faith. There it is again. This man receives his faith because he believed that Christ could do something about it. It is suggesting to us part of our inability to move from where we were is a result that we don't have the faith to believe that God could bless us so that we can see again. I dare you this morning to trust God and have enough faith in Him to believe that He's going to give you sight so that you can be free of your predicament. We close with verse 43. And 43 says, Right away, not later on, but right away, the man could see. And he went with Jesus and started thanking God. When the crowds saw what happened, they praised God. Can you imagine that for a moment? This man, he received his sight right away. No delay. No having to wash his eyes at the pool. No having to put clay on it. No spittle to put on it. He was able to see right away. And he went with Jesus and started thanking God. When God has blessed you to this magnitude, you should surely find yourself with a desire to praise God. When he has done so much for you, there should be no way in the world that anybody can stop you from praising God for blessing your life. You should even now be taking time to thank God for what God has brought you from and what God is taking to you to and for what God is going to do with you. Not only did the man thank God and then go with Jesus, but when the crowd saw what had happened, they praised God. In the life of the church, when we see that God had indeed blessed mightily, some of the followers in and around the church. As believers in God, we should be some of the first ones that are willing to praise God for what he's done. So don't be so selfish. Uh, don't be so inconsiderate that when you see somebody else blessed, when you see somebody else happy, when you see somebody else touched by God's presence, that you don't become jealous but you become a praiser. This morning, I trust that having heard 
the admonition that Christ gives to his followers, that we as believers in Christ, that those of us who are part of the household of faith, we begin to worship God, not just for ourselves, but because God is doing some mighty things in the lives of other people. So don't be jealous, but be supportive and be a praiser for everybody else. Again this morning, we recognize that we are cutting off just a little bit early, but once again, we are grateful for your presence. We thank you uh, that you continue to join us in our Bible study and pray that indeed you've gotten something out of the Word of God this morning as the Spirit of God teaches us what it is He would have us to do. So hopefully from this 18th chapter, you discover that the lesson that Christ was teaching His disciples is one that's prevalent for each and every one of us. Let's go to God in prayer as we close out this morning. God, once again, we thank you so much for the valuable lessons that the Christ taught his disciples. It's our prayer this hour that those lessons that he taught them, we might learn lessons from as well. Help us to know uh, that indeed, God, we have been blessed in so many areas of our lives. And it's not because we've been perfect. It's not because we've been so good. But God, it's because you've been so loving and so kind. So help us to love one another and help us, God, to embrace each other and to celebrate what you're doing over our lives. In the event that this is the last opportunity we meet, it's our prayer that, God, you'll receive us into your eternal kingdom and we can praise you forever. It's in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord, we pray and give thanks. Amen and amen. God bless you and heaven smile upon you. Remember to read chapter 19 for next week and we'll see you then. God bless you.